Okay, so the last time we had the lecture on monitoring and controlling the quality of peer-to-peer -peer systems, we saw a lot on how to monitor peer-to-peer -peer networks, how to get the global information. There we saw gossiping solutions, there we saw tree-based solutions. And uh, now we are jumping to basically, so we had also a summary. So just to, to wrap up, to, to remind you what we had uh, last time. So in gossip-based approaches, as you know, every node is communicating with its neighbor, exchanging the information, calculating averages and sums, and you can also derive a lot of information by this. However, so it, you can apply it in any graph. The drawback is, however, it takes a lot, of, some time to 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 converge to some specific uh, value, and uh, it's also yeah expensive. Quite a lot of redundant messages are used. The tree-based solution is better in using um, the the topology, and because you you use this tree structure to to save to only send necessary messages, so low overhead. But you need this tree structure to work, so you need a DHD. And centralized solutions, of course, they are good, fast and cheap, but uh, you have to pay for it. Okay, so the next question, and that's uh, what you are looking uh, at today, is uh, once we know how the peer-to-peer -peer system is like and what the quality is, the question is how can we make sure that the system quality is the way like we want it to have? So, for example, if you are running... Ah, so here are the, the money. So this is summarized in the, the term management. So what you want to do is to administrate the distributed system and you want to control the quality of service. So what does controlling mean? Um, just to give you a motivation, so just assume you build your own peer-to-peer -peer network and you have an application on top of it, for example, voice of IP or social network or some game, and the monitoring tells you, okay, now the application is too slow. Somehow, for example, in your social network, the users want to request the, the friend lists or the profile pictures or whatever, and it takes too long to find them. So it ta the, the result of the monitoring is that the response time, the lookup time is, for example, three seconds. Now you would like to improve it to lower it down to half a second, for example. So how can you do it because y your network has probably 100,000 nodes and how can you change the whole network in a way that it um, yeah how can you change those 100,000 nodes so that it the, the overall performance improves so the answer is what you could do and what's somehow easy to the first approach to do is that you reconfigure all 100,000 nodes in a systematic way. And this systematic way we will have a look at. So the management enables the access to the peer configuration and it automatically reconfigures all peers once there's a uh, performance leak detected. So um, it coordinates all the, these reconfiguration actions and it also makes sure that it analyzes the monitoring correctly and it plans a correct and better configuration for the next step and also executes this new configuration. So there's also a nice picture to it. Um, because this whole uh, approach of the management of peer-to-peer -peer systems is related to control loops that are also found in electrical engineering, for example. Um, and they have a specific approach how to make whole systems behave in a desired way. So it consists of four steps. So first of all you need to monitor your system. In our case it's a peer-to-peer -peer system so we, what you want to um, find, so we first have to find out how the, the current status is. Then we need to analyze it to find out is it okay, do we need to do something or not. If we decide that we need to do something, sometimes the step is quite complex, sometimes it's easy, but if we need to do something then we have to plan. So we have to plan a new configuration and to decide, for example, if we have a list of 10, 20 parameters that we can tweak which one of them to change. And then once we know which parameters to change, then we need to execute it and to deploy the new configuration everywhere in the system. And this is a, a system model, so that is related also to the figures in electrical engineering. 
it shows us a global peer-to-peer -peer system. So this is what the whole network is basically, all 100,000 nodes. And we have several mechanisms um, working in this uh, system. So every node has its the same mechanism individually running and it results in some overall quality of service. And the system provider can set these values initially, it can configure the mechanisms initially. For example, in the software it provides for downloading, but after, one, after that, once the peer-to-peer -peer system is running, you cannot change it anymore. And there are the network dynamics and peer heterogeneity and application shift. So there's always something changing in the background so that the configuration that you had in the beginning and which might result in a good quality with the changes overall with the time results in some bad quality. So what you need first, you need to somehow monitor the behavior. So you need some control loop back. That's what we had in the previous slides, in the previous uh, lecture, so that the service quality that is measurable, you somehow have a, mon a mechanism for it that obtains this information and provides it for the users and the system provider. So that's what we have up to now. What we also would like to have for this management is to have somehow a um, controller type. So something that we can put into some metric goals, something, some quality goals, basically, that tells us we want to have the response time below one second, for example. We want to have the traffic overhead below one specific threshold. And now this controller is uh, some tool, some black box, that gets the goal functions and gets the current function. And what it can do, and it also gets the current configuration. So not just the service quality is mo monitored, but also the current setup is monitored. So that you have, in one instance, everything that is uh, related to the quality of service. So you have both the goals, the current status, and the parameters that are influencing, basically, uh, your current quality of service. And what you want to have out of it is that you are able to analyze, so to, to check the, the difference between the goals and the current status, and also to plan a new configuration, which is then hopefully better. And this one, and this new configuration, you also need to disseminate, so you also need to deploy to the whole network. So this is a control theoretical model of how the management of the quality of peer-to-peer -peer systems work. Okay. So let's see what kind of elements do we need. So we first have in this, in this control scenario an operator, somebody who tells the goal quality. Of course, it can be also some the users themselves telling we would like to have uh, an average response time of one second, then somehow they agree, but it's simpler for the beginning to just assume we have an operator, somebody like a company, like Skype, for example, and they want to say for our product, for our application, we would like to have, although it's peer-to-peer, -peer, we would like to have that uh, the performance, the lookup time is below one second. But, as I said, it could be also the users themselves who, who vote somehow and the, the votes are aggregated and the average is calculated. That could you could also do, but let's assume we just have this input of uh, quality goals. And we need also the peer-to-peer -peer system to be parameterizable. That means that our, all configurations are open to change. So what what does could this be? What kind of parameters do we have in order to enable the reconfiguration of the system? That could be, for example, stabilization intervals. Um, for example, fixing your fingers in a cord. So in which periods you do that. Or how you pick your neighbors, how do you pick your neighbors in the topology, how do you pick your fingers, there you could also decide either stronger peers or long living peers or according to the ID, there you ha have also probably several strategies. Also the routing table size could change. You could have 20 contacts, you could have 200 contacts, that you could also vary. Replication rate, the three degree monitoring update intervals. There are several aspects that you could change in every protocol. So for example, if you take cord, there are five to 10 configurable parameters that you could change. And these you have to make available to this um, management um, plane, basically. 
And what you, we also need to have is uh, that the whole behavior is monitorable. So that means that although there are several mechanisms running in the network, you would like to ha gain information on all of them. Because it's probably only just one mechanism who creates some trouble and you would like to monitor to find out that it's this single application, this single mechanism, and you would like to only reconfigure that one. So you also want to have information on traffic, on response time, hop count, and all those things that are relevant both for the users, but also, for example, for the yeah, like traffic for the whole network. So you would want to have it monitorable, you want to have it parameterizable. Okay, and uh, so if we look back on uh, what we had up to now, so we had the several monitoring approaches, so w that's what we could assume. So we could assume, okay, we have some predefined quality goals, we have parameterizable P2P overlay, and we have the monitoring. And um, so we have the metric goals, and we have the monitored status. What we would also like to add in contrast to previously, so previously we only had these metrics that are monitored and aggregated over, over all peers, but now we would also like to have the parameters, so the configuration, the current one, to be also monitored. And uh, the reason for this is that although we assume that all nodes are starting with the same configuration, because the system is parameterizable, it might also change while they are offline and they have a different status than they are current, than they so they might be different nodes with different configurations and you still want to find out what is, for example, the average over all parameters to identify what's the impact on the metrics. So this is, let's assume, this is the information that we have as an input and what the management now does is to analyze the basically the goals with the current status, derives a new parameter configuration and distributes it to all peers. And for these two steps we will see some approach on the next slides. Ah yeah, and that's the overall goal. goal. So why are we doing this? So the overall goal is anyway that we want to have these system quality goals which are, which are reached under any circumstances and which are also held um, over a long time so they should we want just to tune somehow the quality of the overall system. Uh, yes, I think this is just a layered um, description of if you think of a peer-to-peer -peer network where you where these changes would um, be. So if you have your this is probably your network, then you have your overlay, some interface, and some mechanisms. They should be all parameterizable, and uh, the monitoring uh, it should be the monitoring would be somewhere here basically. And this is just again the, the control loop depicted in some layered model. It's probably easier if it's printed out. But uh, yeah. Okay, so and um, with respect, so this is just a big uh, slide, but what it tells you is um, there are several layers of autonomy. That means you could have on the very simple side basically many manual steps. So the monitoring would provide you the information, but still human beings would have to analyze it and to pick the configurations um, to improve. So that means here you need highly skilled IT people who analyze the monitoring data, who decide on new configurations, and who initiate then the reconfiguration of the whole system. And as you go to the right, there are several steps in this autonomic computing uh, scheme which increase the automation automation basically so how much is uh, taken uh, and done by the computer itself so the second step would be for example that um, you have in the second yeah step already some suggestions which configurations to, to take and uh, in the third step there is also some IT based correlation and then the analysis of the of the parameters and of the current situation and it helps the IT people to choose better uh, the new configuration so they only approve the changes 
and they have to initiate recommended actions, but there are already these recommendations. So in the beginning, you didn't have any recommendation. In the middle, you have recommendations, but still people are needed to have a look at it. And on the right side, it's all dynamically done and uh, uh, automatically performed by the network itself. So the, the final vision is that you do not need any people anymore to keep your peer-to-peer -peer system running. So the peer-to-peer -peer system in ideally would monitor itself, identify performance leaks and uh, automatically reconfigure itself so that it uh, eliminates this performance leak, so that it's automatically keeping itself in a very healthy state. Okay, however, so the, the simplest, so we want still to do a step, one step after another, so we do not uh, jump into with uh, directly out fully autonomic uh, and automated uh, changes, but we go one step after another. So what we would like to have first is some simple planning, um, which makes it somehow observable what is happening. So we have the monitoring, now we need the analysis and planning, and it should be of course stepwise adapted until some desired interval is uh, reached. So we assume that we can define for the quality of the peer-to-peer -peer system several quality bounds. So it should, the violation, for example, if you take the lookup time, you would like to define a valid interval for it. And only if it's missed, so if it's uh, not in this desired interval, then you want to change something. Ah yes, and um, this planning, so the, the next step after the monitoring basically takes into as an input the current configuration, the metrics and the metric goals, and it um, gives as an output the new configuration. And as we also uh, might assume is that you, if you have a network of 100,000 nodes, for example, and you decide on a new configuration, it takes time to, to take effect. So, for example, if this is the time when you decide on a new configuration and you somehow have to distribute it, then it needs time, some time to, to take effect. For example, if you decide that a new peer selection strategy should be used and the neighbors should be used according to some other uh, metric, then these new neighbors have to be chosen and it takes just some time. And once the change is settled and there are no more set changes, then we might assume, okay, there's the current configuration t took effect and we can an analyze here again. And the new analysis uh, should not be done in this period. So the question is, in a peer-to-peer -peer network, who should initialize, initiate the changes and who decides on the execution? So how can this be done distributedly? And uh, there are several approaches on who decides, basically, to reconfigure. It could be, so if you have an yeah, the, the, it heavily depends also on the monitoring approach, so where you get your information from. So, for example, if you have an unstructured peer-to-peer -peer overlay with gossip-based monitoring, then you could um, use the, inf the, the um, fact that with the gossip-based monitoring, you do not have any structure, so you cannot, you do not have dedicated nodes, which are somehow of higher order than the other nodes. So all of them are the same, and all of them have the same in input, basically, uh, with the gossip-based monitoring. So every node could individually plan locally what to do. So they monitor, they, um, and then they decide to reconfigure themselves. But it assumes that you have a globally accepted planning rules. So if you have the same rules and you get the same input, then you should also should get the same output. So the good thing about it is if you would use this approach and you would let every node reconfigure himself based on the observed uh, monitoring results is you need to do not need any coordination, you do not need any further steps to do to yeah no further protocols needed, just local analysis and planning and it quickly should adapt but it's also 
So the cons, um, it's heavily depending on this gossip-based monitoring, and it also somehow inherits the drawbacks. First of all, the monitoring is a bit slow, okay, but you have to have these globally accepted planning rules, and they cannot really change because you do not have the protocol to 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 send out new rules because, yeah, it's basically the same. If you would have an opportunity to to send out by somebody new rules on how to to change the the configuration, then you could also send out the configuration itself. So it's a little bit tricky on how to change these globally accepted planning rules. And based on this, the, the behavior could also diverge. So if the monitoring results in some delayed observations in one part of the network differing from another part of the network, then you might also come to slightly different behaviors which might um, have get um, greater effect on the long term. So it's not really, yeah, it has some dro benefits because it's fully decentralized and uh, but it also has the drawbacks that you do not have to control whether it's converging into the same direction. Of course, another approach is centralized planning. So if you have, for example, this tree-based monitoring, then you could also reuse the tree structure which you already have to have dedicated nodes which decide on how to pick the configuration. So for example, in the tree you have the root and all the information is gathered there anyway, so this root node could also decide on a new configuration and push it also to all of the other nodes. Yes. So it's um, just like the tree-based monitoring before, so all of the monitoring information is aggregated and pushed to the peer. Now you also aggregate and gather the configuration so that it's easier to analyze the, the status and uh, what is the reason basically for quality leaks and the root can analyze and reconfigure and push the reconfiguration with the global status to all peers. So the good part about it is that all of the nodes get the same decision basically, they all apply it the same way and uh, you could also um, you have directly ah this quality goals can also be centrally tuned. So that means if you, as a system operator, decide that you would have instead of a quality a quality goal of one second as a lookup time, you would prefer to have half a second. So you want to change your quality goal, then you have a central instance basically which you can ask to change the goal. So you do not have to contact all of the nodes to change the quality goals, but it's easier to to change them. The drawback is, so can you trust the root? Is the root really well performing? And uh, yeah, by the need, and you also increase the overhead because you have to uh, to inform all of the nodes about the decision of the root. So higher drawback, uh, so higher, higher traffic overhead and uh, security issue, but you have a probably more efficient and more um, flexible solution. Okay, so we will focus on the second part, because there you still need some further protocols in the first part with the gossip-based uh, approach when everybody just um, applies locally a reconfiguration rule that's not involving any protocols, but this one requires some further aspects, so let's have a look at this. So this is the monitoring tree that we had in the last um, lecture, in the last year, and it's showing how the, yeah, how the monitoring view is aggregated, but it is, it is um, extended by the, so this is a global view, on the performance of the network, but also on the configuration. And what you want, so this is basically was what was before, so you had the local metric statistics and you get back 
pushed from above the global metric statistics, but what is extended is that you also gather the statistics on the local parameters and you also push not the statistics on them, but the new parameter settings. So you, the message types have been extended to also include this management information. So the, the protocol itself is uh, then you gather some fur further information. The root detects whether the quality goals have been reached or missed. And if they have been mi missed, then a new configuration is planned. And the new configuration is then spread with the acknowledgement messages. So it's pushed down the tree uh, hop by hop and uh, applied by the peers locally. So also from the protocol side of view, it's so once you have the monitoring, it's um, simpler to apply the management uh, component. Okay, now the question is, how do we come to a new configuration? So there can there are also different approaches possible, and um, this is basically what closes the control loop. So so the monitoring collects information. This one disseminates the new configuration. Now we need to have to find out how can we get to the new configuration. Um, here will be an example. Just I want to send uh, some words to these various approaches. There are really various approaches how you can identify what um, how the configuration is to be chosen. So for example, you could have uh, simple rules which basically says if the quality is missed by that amount then change this and that configuration so you could manually code it. You could also have very complex machine learning algor algorithms with um, with neural networks which try to learn which configuration, which parameter setting had which kind of uh, result in the global metrics. So you could learn the interdependencies and automatically choose based on your quality requirements the the optimal parameter settings. But this is also very complex. So let's uh, have an example with Cord. Cord is quite well known. So what um, should be done and what has... Uh, this is just an example that shows that it's working. So if you take classical chord, you make to first make it parameterizable. So for example, you have to make the finger table size extendable so, so that you can change it between 20 um, contacts or 160 contacts. So you, that's, for example, a parameter that's to change. And one typical example how you want to use COD is, of course, for lookups. And uh, what you want to, for example, change is the hop count should be in a specific interval. And um, so this is the goal metric and the parameter. Uh, the parameters is, for example, the finger table size. Of course, it could be also which nodes to pick as fingers and uh, which um, stabilization intervals to make and whether to send it parallelly the queries or not. But let's assume we only have this one parameter. And you might also think, why is there an interval? So the point is, if you want to keep a network in a specific uh, yeah if you if you aim at a specific quality level you do not want to improve it below so once it's under a specific threshold in this case a hop count of 10 you do not want to further improve it and if it's for example a hop count of 2 or 3 then basically the quality is too good and it's not really you do not need it that good and you are wasting traffic basically or costs so it's okay to to relax the quality you do not yeah you do not want to have a hop count for example of 5 it's okay to have hop count of 7 and to give some um some resources free so that's why it's an interval and uh yeah in this example the it was just an uh option and test whether it works and whether this uh, control loop um, is feasible or not. 
and it was uh, tested with 10,000 nodes, monitoring tree with an update interval of 30 seconds and branching factor of 4. And uh, for example, what can be observed is uh, so what you want to change at the end is the hop count and what are the interdependencies. So first of all, the c number of contacts, these are the unique uh, yeah, contacts of every node, they are um, proportional to the logarithmus of the finger table size. So that means, for example, if you have a finger table size of 160, so you do not have 160 individual unique contacts, but you have in average around the logarithmus of it as unique individual contacts. And the hop count is anti-proportional to the logarithmus of the contacts. So there are these interdependencies and uh, it has been simulated. Ah yeah, and um, what was the approach? So if the hop count was identified that it's too large, let's start with this, so if you identify that your hop count is 20, then you double the finger table size and if you identify that the hop count is too small, let's say 5, then you can throw 10% of your contacts, of your finger table uh, size away. And um, yes, so this this was the observation, so what you, you can do is to modify the finger table size, affect the contacts, and with affected contacts you affect the hop count. And here's some graph for the interdependencies, so for example, um, where do we start? Let's start in the right. So this is the, the red line is the desired quality interval between uh, 7 and 10 and we started with a finger table size of around 20 and uh, as it was see as it's um, as you can see the hop count was with 20 with finger table size of 20 was around so the hop count was around 80 and then it was det detected yes we missed the quality level so we doubled the number of contacts and then it was measured again it's still missed and then it's doubled again and then it's still missed so it's just not 10 10 point something and then it's doubled again and then we are in the desired quality level and here you can also see the interdependencies of with the finger table size this is the logarithmus of it with the with this axis it's the number of contacts and the number of contacts is anti proportional to the hop count so you can by knowing the interdependencies you can directly basically code the the rules that should be applied when uh, some quality misses are identified and you can take control on the overall behavior of the whole peer-to-peer -peer network and this is quite desirable another example so this is uh, yeah basically one the, the left picture is showing how the quality interval is to read is, is approached from above, so if you start with uh, too high, so initial finger table size of 20 and then your hop count was around 100 and after two steps of automate, automatic adaptation the desired quality level was reached and the same is if your quality is too good after three steps you relax your your routing table so you do not need so many contacts and you are still by throwing away f around 40 fingers um, you get the desired hop count okay um, so why is this good why is it needed so if you think of really that you want to use some peer-to-peer -peer network, especially if you want to make it commercially and you have um, picky customers and you want to have really happy users that are uh, s that are satisfied with the quality and the performance of, of the whole network, then you really need an approach to observe what the quality is, so you need monitoring and you also need to be able to take control of it so that you can change it during the runtime that you uh, have an automated approach to really, if you have 10,000 nodes, like it was in an example before, that it, they can automatically reconfigure themselves so that the performance that you um, 
want to have is really reached. And uh, you can do it both with gossip-based approaches, you can do it with a tree-based approach. The um, important aspect is just that this monitoring and control is really a necessary, necessary need for peer-to-peer -peer systems. What can be also done, and uh, there's also some uh, research work on it, is how you have a long-term storage for monitored status so that you really store these interdependencies, so which parameters led to which quality results. And that you also have an automated distributed learning that you, um, once you, you log these interdependencies and you have protocols on it, that you identify and learn what really the interdependencies are so that you can uh, instantly or very quickly reach desired quality um, levels. And the good thing about this distributed learning is that you also have sufficient resources in the network to you have enough processing time, you have enough storage time, uh, storage uh, space to to really implement it. There was also one uh, project which was exactly aiming at this to to monitor the network's behavior and uh, to identify what's going wrong and uh, to 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 include some automated uh, changes to improve the overall performance of the system and it was uh, sc called the Skynet project but it didn't uh, lead to the termination of the hum of the mankind so it's just uh, applying and aiming at these still very large scale networks but only for these performance uh, issues okay so this was uh, the last slide for this slide set. Uh, we will um, continue with a similar topic. I hope this is still recording. Um, one moment. Yeah, thought it's okay. Okay, so we are continuing with um, this topic, PHP cloud system. So there are several buzzwords included, and um, we will see why this is probably also a big trend in the future. So we'll have a look at what is a peer-to-peer-based cloud, um, and two steps are needed for it. Basically, first, it's a lot of about the resource management, that in the cloud uh, you need some, some specific yeah resources like cpu or storage space at the hand always available so that you also need peer-to-peer -peer system and you need reliable reservations although in peer-to-peer -peer it's everything unreliable so these are the topics that we will cover so let's uh, say some words to the evolution of cloud computing so cloud computing is i think last year was the peak in the hype and um, it was also the the main topic on the CBIRT last year, I think. And where does it come from? So first of all, in the 80s, beginning of 90s, grid computing was the big topic. And that was that um, you had several companies offering, for example, storage space or computational power, and you wanted to e enable high-performance computing. So for example, this hard uh, Ladron Collider or some physics yeah physical um in physical um yeah physical um projects generated lots of data that needs to be processed and for that you needed really some highly specialized grid environments where you could calculate all these large masses of data the next step was the term utility computing which was some something like uh, plug and play uh, uh, retrieval of of resources. So you could you could retrieve computing resources as a pay per use service. So out of the plug, basically. So here you had uh, the uh, you could get as much hardware resources as you wanted on a pay per use basis, and software as a service was a topic. So you, that was the idea that um, you do not have monolithic software code, but you have single modular pieces of code, so-called soft uh, services, which you can buy on demand, on demand, or use 
on also on a paper use basis um, over the internet so that's something like very extreme object oriented programming so you do not have to have the code locally on your device but you just have to know where you can get where you have the interfaces where you have these components in the internet probably you have also several providers for the same service for the same interface that you would like to use and you buy the service so you for every usage you can pay for example and you plug and play your application and also software you can get in the internet on a paper use basis like you wanted to have so applications on demand so here you had hardware demand here now you had applications on demand and cloud cloud computing is bringing it all together so you have um, as much hardware resources as you want you have any kind of software that you can plug and play uh, as you want and uh, you only pay for what you use so very user friendly at the end because um, so just if you take a, a typical server scenario with a monolithic application as a reference cloud computing so, so the drawback of having one single server that you have to pay monthly although you probably do not use it to 100 percent and uh, you have to build one big application for it and you have to write everything your own so there you have really some benefits if you buy parts of the software or buy the resources only for the time that you need it so what could be your future and uh, being in a peer-to-peer -peer networks and applications lecture of course the future will be peer-to-peer -peer cloud computing and the idea is um, that in still in the cloud the providers are of small number and in the if you take the whole network and the whole global internet you have very many users and private PCs that have a lot of resources and to make them available and user friendly and uh, uh, usable that might be the vision of the peer-to-peer -peer cloud so there will be also a slide for it so but getting some further information on the cloud what are the characteristics so first of all this uh, on-demand self-service so you get resources and uh, also of course the the software is always available and you get it when you want to have it so if you for example have your Google mail conto and you just um, flooded with lots of emails you could use up seven gigabytes or whatever and um, it's automatically extending and if you want to have two terabytes that you can also buy to further to it but so you don't have to think in advance how much you need you just use it and there are, the resources are automatically provided and it's also always available basically if you have brought if you have a network access okay you need some more bandwidth but you have it always available so your vast amount of emails you can access everywhere nowadays it's no problem and uh, you could yeah you could use any kind of these uh, services all over the world easily um, what is also so this is more from the provider view is that you by getting all the resources that you want to have um, for the provider it's more convenient because they don't have to have for every individual user the maximum resources that they would like to have but the resources are pooled so there's a big pool of storage space and uh, server capacity and they are assigned to not one single user but to let's say thousands or millions of them so they are all sharing the same same resources and by this it's getting uh, cheaper for the provider and by having this large resource pool that is available for everybody that is shared by them the resources are also elastic that's the, the term for it so that the underlying infrastructure is adapting to the changing requirements so for example if you have one simple um, so if you host your website for example on Google sites or some other provider and you only have a few visitors a day then it's consuming only very less resources 
and uh, bandwidth is throttled, so it's also not very much. But if you are having now uh, some very attractive video on it and millions of users want to visit it every hour, then the infrastructure is adapting. So it's automatically um, giving more bandwidth, giving more storage space and uh, distributing it over the world so that the access time is faster. So the infrastructure is supporting your application. So it allows especially the up, up and down scaling both in access uh, per hour, also users and uh, storage space, everything is elastic. And another nice feature is that everything is also measured. So it's measured how much resources you use, how much time you use, and you are also built according to it. So it's a pay-per-use model. And this is really some nice um, concept for many users of it because previously, especially if, um, if you would have your own server, you would have to pay per month to have it, although probably you do not use it at all. And here you use you have only to pay for the time that you really use the service. There are several um, types, deployment models, which can also classify the, the several cloud systems and they distinguish yeah, with respect to the ownership, so who operates it and uh, who is able to access it. So there's a public cloud, for example, typically owned by one single organization and made available to the general public. So for example, Google uh, or Amazon Easy or something like this. You could also have private clouds. So these public clouds are some something that we are more familiar to because we are typically the public and uh, we only know those providers. But you could also host your own cloud. So all these features described before, you could also host on your own um, at home, for example, if you have enough money. So that means that you own, all have to have the this resource pool and you have to install some desired uh, software. So for ex most commonly these private clouds are, for example, operated by companies internally. So if they also want to have their local email and storage and uh, collaboration systems, so they can now create these uh, private clouds and also use it like they will, we, would li we would use Google but the data is not going to some other operators and some other organizations, so it's more privacy aware. What you could also do if uh, you are a too small company, then you could share and uh, contribute to some community cloud. So for example, some organizations could um, agree on uh, providing and creating a community cloud and use them for themselves and also be sure that the data is not leaving this community cloud. What you could also do is, of course, to, to hybridly uh, mix stuff. So you could uh, use one part of your resource pool for a community cloud, one for a private cloud, so there's variability. Okay, and uh, as a new approach, what could be also prominent in the future is that you introduce some peer-to-peer -peer cloud. So that's something like a, pri a community cloud, but hosted by individual users. So owner, operator and user are the participating peers in the, in the cloud and you need some clever mechanism that make the resources of all the users available so that you have this resource pooling and you have the the desired um, high cloud quality that it's elastically and the resources are extending and elastically uh, adapting to your needs and uh, that you have this measurement and m the billing abilities. So just think of the cloud features that we had on the last slide on this but without any servers included. So. Just think of all the users, let's say 1 million users, they create some resource pool. Of course, they need some network access for it. And if you host on this peer-to-peer -peer cloud some service, 
then the service gets as much resources as it needs. The service consumption is, is metered, so it's, there's some protocol on it. Pay per use, let's, let's see whether there's uh, money in it or not, but you could have some incentives for the users to provide more resources. And um, yeah, you have all the resources that you need. So it's not limited to service, you could also have it with a peer to peer approach. And here's some uh, nice graphical example for it that um, shows how it might work and what there's also yeah what the research trend is currently. So just assume that all the peers have some capacities like storage space, computational power, online time, bandwidth. And what you would like to have is to use these resources but with a service level agreement. So also with some guaranteed yeah, service. So for example, these are the users and they have different resources, so storage space and time. So he's always online, uh, he has computational power, he has some, she has some high bandwidth or so. And um, now they create all this um, magic peer-to-peer -peer cloud. Let's say that's a black box. The black box gathers information about the system, so what kind of capacity is available in the network. So to create a resource pool and if some service is required, for example, so this is some low-level service, so for example storage space because he wants to store something, then there's some opportunity to search in the pool to find appropriate resources. For example, that guy has some storage space. Then it uh, also calculates some trends Will this peer fail? How should the replication be? How to provide the, the, the elasticity? And um, yes, then the, the data is transferred. So for example, yeah, his service is provided. He wanted to have storage space. Now it's hosted by some of the peers. Okay, fine. If somebody else joins, for example, he has bandwidth, he wants computational power, uh, and as, as a price for example could be he should provide bandwidth so that kind of exchange could be division okay now he distributes his computational task for example he wants to simulate something or he wants to to calculate something and if there's some churn and peers are failing then automatically uh, the services are migrated and if for example this uh, service is consuming too much resources then it should be also re um, provided more redundantly, so it should all adapt according to the needs of the users. And again, what are the trends? Why is this probably coming up? I think we saw already the slide, I'm not sure. So, um, first of all, Moore's law, that's the increase of CPU power over time, and it's still increasing, so we will have all the time more powerful PCs and more powerful devices. So it is available and also the bandwidth is growing what we have available. So um, we will have in the future more resources on user side that is currently, let's say, unused. So that's, yeah, the vision is to make these resources that we will have in future on user side available. Okay. Um, Let me just, yes. Um, yeah, what is the, ah, yeah, this slide. So in the future, we'll have more and more um, resources available. And this uh, slide is uh, showing, ah, yeah, uh, if, so let's assume this is our network with the several um, hardware resources that we have at hand and we also want to have uh, of course something like uh, a service market so we both want to have on the peer-to-peer -peer side some uh, some hardware resource pooling but also some service market where we can um, pick basically our software that we want to run in the peer-to-peer -peer network as well so service market for service composition and um, they could be also offered in the peer-to-peer -peer network and the question is, so, 
how to find suitable peers. So how do we do re the resource pooling? So if we want to host some specific service and we know in advance, okay, it will require, let's say, 50 megabytes or 100 megabytes of storage space and a specific amount of, of computational power, how do we find them? And how do we deal with the problem if the service that we would like to run, for example, um, our... Hmm, Let's let's say some some specific calculations we want to do some simulation and it would require one week to run. But the lifetime of the peers are limit it's limited. So probably we find we find a strong peer, but he's failing later on. And uh, how do we support these long-term reservations and long-term service level agreements? So these are the two challenges, for which on the next slides there will be some solutions. So we need, on the one side, we need to find suitable peers, okay? And uh, on the other side, that's, for example, depicting the lifetime of the peer. So if we find a suitable peer, what you also need to do is to allocate redundantly the resources that are available. So for example, in order to not lose one service because it was running on a, on a peer that went offline, we need to do them redundantly and to always make sure that we have sufficient number of providers parallelly running and par parallelly allocated. So we need to have a resource pool to find the nodes and to find sufficient number of them. And uh, this reliable peer-to-peer -peer service, what does it require? So we need to identify the resources, so we need to know what every peer provides. We need to somehow reserve it and we want also to, once we reserve the resources, to be able to host some services on them. Ah, yeah, okay, this is just some, some example as how you could uh, think of it. If you have various capacities, multidimensional, then you would like to define some intervals for capacities. So we would like to have um, capacity B sh should be at least this threshold, so all above, and capacity A should be everything right to this. And um, we want to find uh, appropriate peers. Okay, so first, so the first step, what is needed is to find the r the appropriate peers, and that's somehow um, s uh, that's somehow um, summarized under the term uh, monitoring the peer-specific information. So what we want to have is if we have several peers. Uh, with local sensors, they they should be all able to monitor their local storage space and CPU and online time and all that. We want to have some magic mechanism, basically, where all of them tell what kind of capacities they have, and the mechanism, so this monitoring peer-specific information, should provide an interface with which we can search for peers with given capacities. So to find peers with desired resources. So, for example, a query would be, we would like to have two peers with an online time smaller than 60 minutes, or we would like to have uh, two peers with a storage space higher than 100 megabytes or so. And uh, that should be provided by this mechanism. And what kind of information is it, for example, bandwidth or operating system Java versions, uh, CPU power, disk space, any kind of information that you can think of. And in contrast, so it's still monitoring because you want to obtain information from the system and you want to make it searchable according to the peer-specific information, but the information is not aggregatable. So this is some big difference to the monitoring approaches that we had before, where we had statistics. With statistics it's easier. There you have averages or sums and you could just recalculate them. If you have 10 sums, then you can still create one sum of it. But with that kind of information, you cannot aggregate. So you cannot aggregate the information of peer A and peer B. You, so you still, if you want to make them searchable, you have to somehow, um, you cannot delete everything, and that's creating some overhead issues. So we had so there are um, several approaches how this can be solved, this black box basically. 
and we will see one approach for it. Uh, yes, this is also a list what is um, typically gathered. So, for example, we will have in I think the next lecture an, an example for um, social for peer-to-peer -peer based social network, and this is just showing what is, for example, monitored there. So, the operating systems or Java virtual machine or nodes responsibility range or all that information. So. Um, how does the typical query look like in the, with the capacity-based peer search? So we want to find a specific number of peers with um, requirements on the on the peer-specific information. So for example, the node degree should be above 20, free storage space above 10 megabytes, and online time about above 10 hours. So this is for ex this is how a query should look like. And now in implementing this there are several approaches possible. So you could either have it um, proactive by, for example, a tree, but which is constantly creating this uh, search structure so that once you have uh, a query, it can directly access the prepared data. So it's quickly answered. But it needs for that some structure in the background and this constant uh, monitoring. You could also have it reactive. That's, for example, if you would um, have some unstructured peer-to-peer -peer network, which is very similar, where we have had this uh, keyword-based search. So in an unstructured peer-to-peer -peer network, as we saw, uh, you could search for MP3 files, for example, from Britney Spears, and then you type in Britney Spears as a uh, singer, and then the network is flooded, and all of the valid matches are sent back. That could you could also do, but it takes quite, quite a lot more time to be answered because the data is not prepared and you're creating then during the runtime with every query lots of uh, traffic. Here in with the proactive mode you are generating constantly the traffic overhead but once you have a query it's taking uh, only a small amount of traffic. Okay, um, if you would have it reactive then um, so if you flood the network, if you, if you would flood it, then probably you find all of the matches. If you have a structure, then you have the, like a tree structure for example, then you have the problem that if you would really want to have a complete information over all nodes, then the higher levels in the tree are overloaded because they are containing too much information. So it's the design decision in this solution is uh, that the information is incomplete, but 100% of the queries should be solved. And the, the challenge is now, um, so if we apply it to a tree structure and um, the information is growing as we approach to the root, then the nodes, so the so-called coordinators, the inner nodes in the tree, might be overloaded. And how is the, the approach? So we also use this tree structure as monitoring topology, but uh, weaker peers are replaced by stronger so-called support peers, which are able to handle the traffic overhead. So these are again the tree architecture decisions, so it's a new layer on top of, so it's very similar to the monitoring tree that we had before. It's also proactive, it's also a tr tree, it's also, um, I mean, the same approach like we had with the monitoring for the yeah system statistics in the beginning. So also the trees are built the same way. So one node matches its own ID to the unified ID space, identifies its position in the tree by calculating, starting with the highest domain ID and approaching down until it finds a node ID, a coordinate ID which it is responsible for. And this is how the node finds its position in the tree. This is also like we had it in the previous lecture with the SkyICOM uh, tree topology. So now the, the difference is just how this information is used. Okay. Still the tree, an example tree. Okay. So now how is it used? Because we have the issue that if we would just push the, the information about the, the peers and with the peer information up the tree, then the higher nodes would be overloaded. 
So now we introduce so-called support peers for load balancing. And the first assumption is that every peer can define a maximum load, how many um, peer information it is able and willing to, to um, store. And for example, if one node, for example that one, is overloaded and cannot take all of the information that is transferred from here and so from its uh, children nodes, then it can pick among the information that it gets from them about the peers in the network, some support peer, and say, okay, you should take over my role and uh, the children peers should send the corresponding peer-specific information to that support peer. And with it, you still have the um, tree structure, but you replace the weak peers in the net in the, in the tree with stronger peers that are able to carry the load. So how do you pick the support peers? So just assume that here in the in the bottom you only have one peer that you have to monitor yourself, and you are sufficient powerful enough to make that. And as you approach higher, you gather information about the, the peer-specific informations below you. So, for example, uh, this node knows should know the strong peers in this domain, so all of them here. And it can it identifies among those nodes the two best peers in the domain. So, yeah. And the best peer it can uh, send up. Okay, this is uh, the best in my domain, so it's probably uh, more useful for you, but I can take the second best for myself if I'm too weak. And by this, um, the best peers are always propagated up, so at the root, the best peer is really available, the strongest peer and um, highest bandwidth and highest uh, uh, storage space and everything, that is available to take over the most loaded job, basically, and for every um, level below, it's the second best from the whole domain which is available to become a, a support peer. And the idea is that although, okay, it's not the best one from the domain, but still the second best should be good enough to take over the load. You also, yeah, and that results in a tree with uh, strong peers where all overloaded peers should be eliminated and exchanged, and uh, no peers should be overloaded because, especially, the nodes communicate with each other how much load they are able to carry. So, there's also this example how this looks like. So, let's assume this is some snapshot of the tree. And uh, we have a sub so the, the children node um, 1 and 2. And this is the amount of how much traffic, no, how much uh, information, no, how, this is the, the amount of information of how many peers they are monitoring. So this node is, has information about 500 peers, and this one has information about 750 peers. And the coordinator is able to take 200. So to receive the maximum of receivable attributes, that means peer entries, is 200. And the, its parent coordinator is able to take 3000. Okay, so in the beginning, before they, with their first message contacting the parent node, they do not send everything at once and overload the peer, but they send only a smaller amount, let's say 50, and say, oh, I have a uh, uh, 400, uh, <laughs> okay, let's assume it, that that would be 20 and that would be also 20. Then it would be easier with the maths. So, uh, interesting. Okay, so in total, however, that should be uh, 750 and that should be 500. Okay, and that note, so just uh, apply the, the corrections that it fits. Okay, so he received 50. Let's say, okay, this you need to change. Okay, in total he received 100 entries, which he forwards, and he has nothing more received. But he knows, okay, there will be uh, 450 and 650, so 1,100 more. And I want somebody 
who can support me and I contact the second best peer out of this 100 because I know so they should me send me for example the ordered list of their peers they know and these are the top 100 list uh, 100 peers of of these uh, 1250 nodes and now I contact the second best out of this 100 and he has for example maximum of 4000 and I ask him okay I need some help you should help me and take over the job if he is not used by anybody else and he is not used by anybody else because nobody below is using him and nobody above anyway so he is uh, still free and he accepts the request and uh, the parent coordinator also in, in this next step answers okay you send me 100 and I'm able to carry in total 3000 nodes uh, 3000 in entries basically 3000 um, peer informations okay good to know so um, here the numbers are already adapted good so uh, the node answers to the children node yes uh, send me 80 percent uh, send me 80 um, peers and uh, send 420 to my support peer and you should send me 120 um, contacts and uh, the support peer should receive 630 so all of the entries are sent and uh, forwarded then to the parent coordinator which is able to carry all of it so this is the approach how those children nodes are sending their information to their coordinator so the, the parent peer and the support peer and so you just we just extended the tree by in maximum one further node per inner node okay this is just for printing uh, so if you print it out then you have it at one scene and so how are the queries then done so if you are looking for a peer let's say you are looking for uh, I am peer P looking for seven peers and uh, I give some capacity requirements for example on storage space or on uh, computational power or whatever then I contact my parent peer he forwards it to his support peer and attaches fitting peers and the support peer contact sends it to the to to the parent peer of those two and the, the list is extended all the way up and once the list is full then the answer is sent back to the peer to, which requested uh, the initial which sent out the initial request and uh, the idea is that by going up the tree you get more and more powerful nodes because um, you could also yeah you could also um, um, include some filter so if you both of them are not able to carry so in this example if they are both not able to to yes if they this 4000 and 2000 and uh, 200 in the sum is not enough to to um contain all of the entries from below then you just forward the the best that you can do so you take the best 4200 and forward it and all of the rest is basically skipped and uh, deleted but if you are having this query this way then the the weaker peers which are still matching the the requirements are still used in the query so if you stay, start a query then you find peers which are matching your requirements but they are not too good so that if a stronger requirement would come um, you do not waste the better peers which are higher in the tree okay um, ah yeah again some some um, evaluation that you get a feeling for it here with one with 10,000 nodes and cord and uh, the monitoring yes and heterogeneous peer capacities and here for example this is how the nodes joined and there was a little bit churn and then the peers went offline again and this is the use of the support peers dynamically in the tree with 10,000 nodes so maximum eight support peers that's not really too much and if you have a look at uh, how much you 
the root, for example, knows about the whole network, um, it's still not the maximum. So um, here in the setup, every node could define a load limit, how much, how many information on how many peers it's able and willing to carry. And um, yes, we had the support peers, as it's seen. And this graph shows, for example, the, the green one, how much um, the root itself, how much entries it was able to, it was willing to store. And as you see, it's maximum 2000 and it's also varying. And the, the reason why it is varying is because the root is also replaced during churn. So if in the tree structure, if somebody, some other node gets the position, so if the root is leaving and a new node is joining, then you get a new peer with less capacity or more, or so it's changing. And the support peer that is somehow available is also changing. So this is the load that the, the blue curve is showing the load of the support peer of the root. And together, this is how much they knew about the network. So in the best case, it was a slightly above 6,000 nodes they knew together out of 10,000. So you don't get, it depends how good your nodes are, but you do not have typically 100% of complete view at the root, for example. However, it is still uh, useful because um, this is these are graphs of where the queries are originated and solved. Um, I think inter most interesting is this one. So if you start a query, uh, so over all queries uh, are seen, if it started somewhere, hmm, let's other approach. So better to have a look at this graph. So this is the level of the query or originators. It's just showing in which level of the tree the query has been originated. And this is the level of the query being solved. And the further back is the root. And this is going down to the basically um, the levels below. And the, the, the darker the, the grayscale is, basically, the more difficult is uh, the query, so the complexity of the solved queries. So that means that very complex queries, which are very demanding, are solved higher at the root because they are the best peers are available. And if you have um, simpler requests, then they are also solved at lower la levels. And uh, how many of the results were solved that you can basically see here if it's somehow yeah. so it's just showing um out of the 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 list of answers so the list of peers that were found as uh, matching only 1% no even 0 1 0. Point one percent was missing so there was only very s few ones that had mis had uh, wrong answers basically uh, probably too complicated okay but more interesting uh, having a look at uh, the the costs and uh, the characteristics of it so the index and the querying traffic is not too much so if we take it into together so in this case i think every 5 minutes the current peer capacities has been measured so over so if you average it per second, so it's only very 6 bytes, 10 bytes, because it's every 5 minutes only. But there's a strong imbalance in the, the load. So this is the, the monitoring, this is the acknowledgments from the previous uh, lecture, basically, the, the statistics. And the blue curve is showing the traffic overhead in relation to the peer. So this is peer num the, the strongest loaded peer and then the tenth strongest loaded peer. So you see you have some peers which are very strongly loaded and um, most of them, so in this case let's say 9000 peers, have um, only 1% of the load which this node has. So there's a strong imbalance. But this is also desired because we want to uh, to to map the traffic load to the stronger peers and uh, 
to not have it evenly distributed but matching the peer capacities. Okay, there are several further approaches how this peer capacity search can be solved. The one typical approach is so called multidimensional location based search. Um, the reason is because if you think of these capacities as dimensions, for example, the CPU being the x-axis, CPU power and the storage being the y-axis, and um, whatever storage space being the z-axis, you could span a multidimensional um, yeah, r space, and every node has a single point in it. And what you want to do is to have this multidimensional location-based search, so you want to define for all of these dimensions some specific uh, thresholds, and you want to find all nodes in this at this location. And how else it could be done? So you could, of course, uh, flood the whole network and find all your all your matching uh, nodes, which match your capacity requirements. But it's of course inefficient. You could also have a fully so so random walk or some rendezvous approaches. But also there, if you would use this unstructured approaches, they are not fully retrievable retrievable so you do not really get if you ask for five um, nodes with ca specific capacities either you do not find them or you have to have quite a lot overhead to really have something like flooding you could also reuse ex existing structured overlays using space filling curves that looks like uh, this uh, picture should it be and this you could imagine this is a two-dimensional um, space, and you have this multi, this uh, space filling curves, which basically maps the two-dimensional space to one-dimensional structure. So you could uh, use basically location-based search in a two-dimensional space, but using only chord, for example. Okay. It's also inefficient, like this uh, scene. And what could it be also done? You could also use CAN, which is already multidimensional. And you could uh, think of uh, for every capacity type as one dimension to use CAN. And however, also the lookup complexity is quite uh, low. That was um, so the lookup times would be quite high so that every query would uh, need some higher delay. Okay. What could be also done is this uh, topology or structure based on peer capacities. So there are also some solutions which uh, try to cluster peers with high bandwidth or peers with high storage space so that you are, when you are looking for peers with specific qualities, you know in which direction to root and you go only that far that your capacity requirements are reached. However, if your capacities change, then you also would have to change your neighborhood. That's also not um, the best approach. So there are several approaches just to, to keep in mind. Okay, so that's just a overview for this peer capacity based uh, peer specific information monitoring. Same properties like we had in the statistics monitoring. Um, so it just needs the um, key-based routing functionality for root and lookup, and it's usable by all peer-to-peer -peer networks. The peers can define their maximum load, so nobody's overloaded in that sense, and the peer heterogeneity is uh, also supported, so stronger peers take also stronger load. Okay, so this was step basically number one. And uh, step number two of the peer-to-peer -peer cloud. So let's assume we are now able to find peers with, according to the capacities. So we are somehow able to create this resource pool. And um, what is a resource pool? That's yeah, all the capacities in the network being available and searchable and usable. So what is the next step? Is to somehow make it usable. So if one of the nodes one of the users, for example, wants to have storage space. That's probably easier, but if somebody wants to perform some calculations, which are 
lasting for example two months but then we would probably find the nodes which are providing the desired CPU capacities but they are leaving after two days so it's not sufficient to find the resources but we also have to reserve them for a long period and uh, one drawback about this is really the the, the probability that the peers are failing. So finding the peers is step number one, but um, here's a, a figure that is showing, for example, the probability that the peer is failing after um, 50 minutes or after 10 minutes. So what you can see is if the peer was online already um, if, when he just joined, then it's very probable that he leaves the network in the next 15 minutes with a probability of uh, 30%. So the problem is somehow that the peers are short living. So they are not, yeah, the average online time is basically around four hours. And this is uh, an issue when you really want to have reliable reservations in, in peer to peer systems. I think it's uh, not worth to, to start with this uh, slides today. So we will have a, a look at it next week. And then we will see how we can really reserve sufficient amount of resources for a long, long time, two months, one year, in a peer-to-peer -peer network. So thank you very much for your attention and see you then next week.